Well, good morning. God is good, isn't he? And all the time. Amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to be together, to worship with your people, to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word as we hear your word. I pray that our hearts would be fertile soil, that your word would take deep root and accomplish its work in our lives. We thank you as we look into this subject, may we see more and more of who Jesus really is, and may that revelation change our hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> uh, for the past several weeks, we've been in a series on uh, the tabernacle. Uh, that sounds real exciting, I'm sure, but uh, it actually is and can be. The, there are several reasons why the tabernacle is significant. One is because the more we see the glory and beauty of Christ revealed in Scripture, the more our love and appreciation for Him grows. And the more we come to understand the incredible work of redemption that God has accomplished for us, the, the greater our faith will grow. The, apparently, God thought it was important enough to include over 50 chapters in the Bible just on the subject of the tabernacle, its construction, its consecration, its rituals, its meaning, and so on. Uh, when you compare that to the work of creation, creating the universe, there's two chapters. Uh, so God seems to think it was important enough to add a considerable amount of information. But for our purposes this morning, it's significant because it provides a pattern for how to come to God and how to move deeper into our relationship with God. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, we are invited to enter into his very presence, to come before his throne, to commune with him. And tragically, many Christians sort of stay in the outer court and never move into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. So we're going to talk about some of those things. The message today is <clears throat> on the outer court how to come to God, how to come to God. There are certain basic questions that every religion tr seeks to answer. Uh, <clears throat> is there a God that's helpful to believe in a God if you're going to be a religion? Uh, although it's not necessary, there are religions that uh, don't believe in God. Uh, the Bible says those who come to God must first believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who come to him. So we have to believe that there, there's a God out there to come to and it's worth coming to him. So we need to know, we ask questions like, is there a God? What is this God like? <clears throat> is this God approachable? Can we come to him? And what do I have to do to be rightly related to God? So how do we come to God? This morning we're, we'll be exploring the significance of the outer court, the sort of courtyard of the temple, which includes the gate, the brazen altar, and the laver. Uh, the laver basically was a basin that the priest would wash their hands and feet in before they went into the holy place. We're going to look at that next week. Uh, I want to look at the gate and the altar. The altar speaks of being justified by faith. The laver speaks of being sanctified for service. And the gate speaks of our entrance into uh, God's presence and how to become part of God's people. Uh, could we have the first slide so that we have an idea of this? 
This is what it may have looked like. The tent in, inside, you have two parts, the tent and the courtyard. So you can see the tent there. The courtyard is surrounded by a, a, a linen curtain fence. The tabernacle itself, with the covering on it, is, is about 45 feet long by 50. 15 feet wide. Now that's just about the size of this platform. This platform is actually 44 feet by 18 feet, so you figure that's about how big it was. Uh, it was divided into thirds. Actually, the, the rear third was the Holy of Holies and the front part of that, so probably from about here back to there would have been the size of the Holy of Holies. It would have been 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits, a perfect uh, cube, or approximately 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. Um, numbers are significant often in Scripture, and, and the fact that it's 10, 10 by 10 by 10, uh, a perfect cube, the number 10 speaks of perfect order, uh, and that's where the throne of God was, so the, because it's from there where God ruled and reigned, bringing order to his, his creation. In the original creation of uh, the universe uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it, it says the phrase, and God said, is used 10 times, speaking of the perfect order in his creation, original creation of the universe. And we have the Ten Commandments, which speak of, speak of perfect order in our, uh, our own personal lives. But the tabernacle tent would have been about this size. The outer court would have been about 150 feet uh, long by 75 feet wide. The outer court was marked off by a, a curtain fence that surrounded the whole area Figuratively speaking, this, would, this fence separated those who were within from the world outside. So figuratively speaking, it speaks of those who are part of the people of God within this uh, area surrounded by linen, a linen curtain. Linen in Scripture speaks of righteousness, and so it's righteousness that separates us from the world around us. But it's not the righteousness of works that separates us. It's not that we are <clears throat> that we are somehow holier, more righteous, better, uh, and that's why I'm I'm inside here and you're out there. It's the righteousness of faith that says it's not based on my religious performance. It's not based on my goodness. It's not based on uh, my holiness, my purity, my righteousness, uh, but it's based on my faith in Christ, who is the righteous one. <clears throat> Someone said, there aren't good people, there are people who have experienced the goodness of God. Um, it's God's goodness that defines uh, the people of God, not not the their uh, super holiness in that. So we come on the basis of faith in God. Uh, can we have the second slide? This is a, sort of a picture of different things going on and happening, what, what it might have looked like. I want you to note in particular, we're going to look at, I want to talk about the gate on the left end of the curtained in area. The gate, there are a number of important things we learn from the gate. The gate is what gain, how do we gain access uh, into God's purpose. The, uh, there were actually three gates or three entrances. Uh, one is an entrance into the outer court. And then at the tent, the front of the tent, there was another gate, same fabric, only this was not just white linen, 
they used utilized four colors for the, the the gate going into the outer court, and then the same fabric materials and colors are used in the what was called the door of the tabernacle to go into the holy place. And then, of course, there was the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. You remember in Psalm 100, verse 3, it says, I will come, in, come into his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise. Um, there are four colors. Colors are significant. Uh, and they, they represent four aspects of Christ and his, uh, his nature. The colors are blue, purple, scarlet, and white. This is in your notes. Blue speaks of heaven, and it speaks of Christ as the heavenly Son, which corresponds to the four Gospels, the Gospel of John, which is written largely to Christians, emphasizes the divinity of Christ. Purple is the color of royalty, and so it speaks of Christ as the royal sovereign, and that corresponds to the Gospel of Matthew, which emphasizes the kingship of Jesus Christ. The scarlet color speaks of Christ as the suffering Savior, and that corresponds to the Gospel of Luke, which emphasizes the humanity of Christ. And finally, the white speaks of righteousness uh, and of Christ as the righteous servant. Uh, it corresponds to the Gospel of Mark, which emphasizes the servanthood of Jesus Christ. So four is a very significant number associated with the gate. There were four colors suspended by four pillars uh, hung by four sockets. <clears throat> the number four in Scripture speaks of the whole earth, the entire earth, uh, and refers to things that are universal in their scope. Uh, the four winds go out in all four directions, the four different points of the compass, the four directions through all the earth. The four corners of the earth, the, there were four rivers that flowed out of Eden to all the earth, uh, there are four Gospels, which is the message of Jesus Christ going forth to all the earth. Matthew 28, 18 and 19, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, the Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and to the ends, the very ends of the earth. The disciples asked Jesus, uh, when will the end be? And while there are a lot of general things like earthquakes and, and stuff, the one specific sign of the end of the age is that the gospel will have been preached to all the earth. And so the gates speak of <clears throat> the fact that salvation is offered to everyone. No one is excluded. No one is left out. Whosoever will may come. You don't have to be good enough to qualify for it. You just have to be humble enough to receive the handout of amazing grace, which is harder for some people than trying to... Uh, be justified by their righteous acts. The message of the gate is this. The gate is always open, and it's open to all. The gate is always open, and it's open to all. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is good and pleases our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The gate through which we come is always open and open to all. And that gate is Jesus Christ. Now the caveat is this. 
there's only one gate. It's a gate which is open to all. It's always open. The invitation is there for everyone to come through the gate. The gate that God has appointed, there is only one way, one road, one path, one door, and that door, that path, that way, that gate is Jesus Christ. Whether you're a, a king or a beggar or a Jew or a Gentile, rich or poor, learned or ignorant, a celebrity or a nobody, a just sort of run-of-the-mill run ordinary sinner or a, a, a totally off-the-charts kind of sinner, the fact is we all came, come the same way through the gate. And these, there are some scriptures there in your notes. John 10, verse 9 I am the gate. Nobody enters, whoever enters through me will be saved. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. <clears throat> Now here's the, when, when you get up and make an exclusive faith claim like that, people start, no, oh, you, can't, you can't say that. that, isn't that, doesn't that sound arrogant to, to say Jesus is the only way? You know, can't we come any way we want? Isn't that, isn't that judgmental? Isn't that exclusive? Uh, and in fact, some people have even said that, that they accuse the people of spiritual racism to say that you're the only way, the right way. Some have even called it hate mongering. Let me, let me give you an example. If, 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 if everyone in this room, everyone in the world had cancer and someone came up with a cure for cancer, and they, they come to you and they say, we found somebody who's got a cure for cancer. And why don't you go to him? I, I went to him and I was cured. And uh, you say, no, no, that's, that sounds awful arrogant. How can you say that your cure for cancer is the only cure for cancer? And, you know, that's, that sounds judgmental, like you're, you're judging everybody else who uh, has cancer no, I'm not, no, I'm not judging them. I'm just saying I was, I was a cancer. I had cancer, and, and, and I've been healed. I just want to share that good news with you. No, that's, you're, you're excluding everybody else uh, by doing that. Now, <clears throat> would that be your response? I think your response would be, <laughs> give me his address, uh, uh, because uh, we want to avail ourselves of that. Especially when the person who is offering the cure for cancer is offering it for free. And to anyone and everyone who comes, all you have to do is come and get it. Well, Jesus is the gate. The gate is always open and is open to all. Let me suggest to you that the exact opposite is true. Christianity is, in fact, the most non judgmental most inclusive, most embraceive, uh, not abrasive, embraceive, uh, the most welcoming, gracious, tolerant religion that there is. Now, why do I say that? Well, let, me, let me point out, first of all, Christianity is not the only religion that makes exclusive claims to truth. In fact, every religion makes certain exclusive claims to truth and believes itself to be the right way to God, if not the only way. If you didn't believe that yours was the right way, you, would, you wouldn't follow that religion. You'd find, find a religion that claims to have the right, right way. At the heart of the matter, however, the real issue is this. What is their assessment of the human problem and what is their answer to the human predicament? 
What is their assessment? What, how would they define the basic problem of man? And what is the answer they offer for the human predicament? For instance, if you're... Uh, Buddhism says the basic problem of man is that is desire. Desire. If we didn't have any desires, we would just be perfectly content, live in peace, and there would be no envy, there would be no wars, there would be no lust, there would be no jealousy, no coveting. We would all be content with ourselves and therefore content with one another. The way of salvation is defined as the elimination of all desire. That's one approach. And then, of course, you've got Hinduism, which says the basic problem of, of man is ignorance and he needs enlightenment. The way of salvation is enlightenment. Um, enlightenment, presumably, with the truth, uh, if we believe there is truth. Uh, but Christianity comes and says the basic problem of man is that he is separated from God because of his sin, which has resulted in spiritual death. The way of salvation is to be reconciled to God through faith in a substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf, which was Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross. And spiritual regeneration that comes from the renewing of the Holy Spirit in our life, reconnecting us to the life of God. And you see those, what our analysis of the problem is and our answer to the predicament will determine how we come to God. But here's why I say that Christianity is actually more tolerant and less judgmental because every other religion teaches some form of salvation by human effort, by good works, by earning it. Somehow, you, the way to come to God is you need to earn it. You need to be good enough. You need to be righteous enough, holy enough. Uh, you need to, to earn it some uh, way. Um, and so, let me, give you, let me give you a quote. This was back in the second century, uh, referring to someone who was an, an, an avid uh, opponent of Christianity. Someone speaking of him says, he never tires of pointing out to Christians the absurdity the contemptibleness, the revoltingness of their conception of God. Every other religion has some regard for itself and admits the respectable, the cultivated, irreproachable people into its fellowship. And that's basically what religion is. Religion is uh, how to be, what to do in order to be acceptable to God. But Christianity, he says, runs after the riffraff on the streets as if it was a positively bad thing to have committed no sin, or as if God were a robber chief who gathered criminals around him. He then says, the deity has dealings only with the pure. That's the inviolable maxim, axiom. Only Christianity frees us from the heavy burden of keeping the law. Only Christianity invites all to come to God and excludes no one from the offer of salvation. Only Christianity reaches out to the poor, the marginalized, the lepers, the outcast, the rejects, the weak, the sinful. Why is that? Because we know that we are sinners. When we come to God, we come to God with saying, I'm not good enough to come to God. I don't qualify, uh, my religious performance doesn't measure up, I don't keep all the rules. 
And apart from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, there would be no hope. We come not on the basis of our own goodness. We come as a sinner saved by grace. And when you come that way, how many of you know there's, you have no desire to point fingers at other people? Say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And only Christianity offers the amazing claim of unconditional love, that God loves us, and God has loves us so much that he provided, he sent his own son to die on our behalf. And so Pharisees come from believing that I'm more righteous, more holy, have my, my religious performance has been such that I, I have the right to look down on you. But if we, we come as sinners saved by grace, then we, we come praising God for his extravagant grace, his amazing love, and his incomprehensible mercy. So we want to, if we could put up the third slide, we want to talk for a few minutes, I want to talk about the brazen altar. Brazen simply means brass or bronze. There you have a, a kind of a close-up picture of what the altar might have looked like and the laver. The laver. When we enter the gate, the first thing we encounter is the brazen altar. The message of the brazen altar, the message you get, is that only on the basis of the shed blood of a substitutionary sacrifice can we come to God. The brazen altar signifies the death of Christ on the cross. A death that was a substitutionary death, it was taken in our place. Christ died for the sins of the world. And there were several things that were significant about this altar. The altar, first of all, the materials that went into making it was acacia wood and brass. Acacia wood, we talked about a few weeks ago. Acacia wood was an incorruptible wood. It was uh, virtually indestructible. It wasn't subject to, it stayed hard and firm. It wasn't subject to mildew and, uh, and so on. It was virtually indestructible and it was incorruptible, signifying the sinless humanity of Christ. Wood has its root in the earth and is of the earth. It speaks of the humanity of Christ incorruptible and uncorrupted, the sinless, the sinless humanity of Christ. The brass, brass speaks of suffering in general, suffering divine judgment in particular. And brass is virtually fireproof. Uh, back then and still now, it's, it's one of the most fire-resistant types of uh, metal speaks of the enduring the fires of suffering and specifically the message of, of the brazen altar is that while Christ hung on the cross, he endured the fiery furnace of God's wrath against sin. The punishment that we deserved collectively was suffered by Christ. That's why I think it's Significant that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, in this composite description of the glorified Christ, one of the things that are mentioned about, about his feet, the feet would be the part that touched the earth. And in his earthly sojourn, uh, it says his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And he endured the fires of God's wrath against sin. Second thing I want to mention about the, br the bronze altar 
is the fire. In Scripture, when, very often when a person presented an offering, the way God would show that he accepted that offering and accepted the one who made the offering was by fire coming down out of heaven. It was true for Jacob, it was true for Abraham, it was true for Gideon, it was true for Elijah uh, and a number of others. Uh, fire would come down from heaven, consume the, the offering, signifying his acceptance of that. Well, and the brazen altar was not lit by any hand of man. It was fire came at the consecration of the tabernacle. Fire came down from heaven and ignited the fire underneath the brazen altar. It was a supernatural fire. It came down in recognition of God's acceptance of Christ, who was our substitutionary sacrifice. And that fire was never to be to go out. The reason it was never to go out is because God's acceptance of Christ and our standing in the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf was perpetual. It was continual. And we are eternally secure in, the, in God's acceptance of us because our faith is in the sacrifice of Christ. It's also significant that only fire from the brazen altar could be used to a uh, priest would put it in the, the censer which they would put the incense in. They would go into the holy place and offer up incense, but it had to be by the fire of the brazen altar, uh, signifying that our pr these incense speaks of God, uh, first of all, of Christ's intercession for us, and then our intercession, our prayers, our petitions, our praise to God. And the, the, stand, the reason uh, we are, our petitions are accepted by God is because of the fact of his acceptance of the sacrifice of Christ. So in other words, the basis on which we can draw near to God and present our petitions and offer our praise uh, is on the basis of the acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name, who is the sacrifice who has been accepted by God and enables us to come into his presence. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, for this very reason, the Bible says they offered strange fire before the Lord. They went into the holy place to offer incense, but it wasn't fire from the brazen altar. It was a fire of their own making. And we'll look more at that when we get into the uh, holy place next week and we look at the, uh, incense, the altar of incense. But when we come to God, we come on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ and his acceptance to God, which means we're accepted by God. Third thing I want to mention is, is that the, this brazen altar was also called the altar of burnt offerings. Uh, the offering, most offerings would be cut up. Some of it would be given to God. Some of it would be given to the priest. Some of it you got to eat yourself. But the whole burnt offerings were given to God entirely. Uh, it was entirely consumed by the fire. The priest didn't get any. You didn't get any. It all belonged to God. It spoke of being completely consecrated to God, which reminds us, first of all, that Christ, in his commitment to God, was totally, wholeheartedly committed to him. Lo, it is written in the volume of the book, I have come to do your will, O God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. I haven't come to do my will, but the will of the Father. And his life was given totally to God, and even in the Garden of Gethsemane, his last, among his last words were, may this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it speaks of wholehearted devotion to God. 
that when we come to God, that we come wholeheartedly, wholehearted offering of ourselves to God is not the, is not the finish line, it's the starting line. Uh, we start by offering ourselves to God. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, it says, in, in view of the, uh, what he just said in the last 11 chapters, the mercies of God and the amazing work of uh, salvation through Christ, he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living and holy sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable sacrifice of worship. He's saying, like a burnt, whole burnt offering, present yourself completely and totally to God. And then when we have presented ourselves to, to God, we present the things that we do to God. Lots of times we get it backwards. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about a hypocrisy that the Pharisees would do, and they would often say, say uh, in taking, making, making vows, that if you made it by the altar, I swear by the altar, then it wasn't binding. That was kind of like saying my fingers were crossed. It doesn't count. Oh, I swear by the altar that I will do this. Everybody knew that means you weren't bound by it. But if you said I swear by the offering on the altar, I swear by the gift on the altar, then it was binding. And Jesus said that doesn't even make sense. Which is greater, the altar or the gift on the altar? The altar is greater. If anything, you should swear by the altar. Um, because what sanct he says, what sanctifies the gift but the altar? What sanctifies our service to God and the things we give uh, to God in service, those are sanctified by the altar. The altar speaks of a life of wholehearted commitment and devotion to God. So it begins with our wholehearted devotion to God, out of which we offer the things that we do. But it begins with the offering of who we are. And the last thing I want to mention is this, that when they came to the brazen altar, they would bring a lamb and they would put their hands on the head of the lamb, laying all of their sins onto this lamb. And at the same time, it was a reciprocal exchange. I imparted my sins to this sacrifice who would then die on my behalf because of my sin. But I would receive the purity of the unblemished lamb. The righteousness would be imparted to me. And in so doing, there was the offering of yourself, the accepting God's evaluation of what Christ has done. We lay our sins on Christ, and we are then declared righteous. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Because there is a, a divine exchange that takes place. Not only do we, that our Jesus was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. He bore our sins in his own body so that we might be righteous. And so the message is this, and I close with this question. Have you offered yourself to God? Have you come to him trusting in the work of Christ who was made sin so that you might be made the righteousness of God? The gate was open to everyone, but when you came in through the gate, you were confronted with the problem of your sin. But that problem was dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. Your sins were forever removed. And we put our faith not in what we, we do for God. We put our faith in what God has done for us. 
Let me read this quote from James Emery White in his book, Embracing the Mysterious God. Coming to faith, he says, is like falling in love. For some, it's a head over heels, love at first sight with the rush to the altar. Others find the idea of, of spiritual things wholly to their unlike like, liking, only to discover that many of their first impressions were mistaken and an acceptance moves toward appreciation and then almost unnoticed, slips over the line into heart, heartfelt embrace. Some of you can remember the exact moment when you gave your life to Christ, you stepped over the line of faith, and there was an amazing change in your life, and it was love at first sight and, and so on. Some of you aren't even quite sure where, when you crossed over that line, uh, but you know there was a time when you gave your life to God, you accepted his sacrifice in Jesus Christ, and went, came to him for forgiveness of sins. He goes on to say, in either case, Malcolm Muggeridge was right when he said that in the end, coming to faith remains for all a sense of homecoming, of picking up the threads of a lost life, of responding to a bell that has long been ringing, or taking your place at a table that has long been vacant. Would you bow your heads? We've been talking about coming to God and coming through the gate. The gate is open to all and always open. That it's not based on our being holy enough, righteous enough, good enough. It's based on our willingness to receive the life that God has offered to us through the death of Jesus Christ. And I want to pray. Do any of you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm at the gate. I feel like I'm at the gate. I'm right there. Uh, and, and I want to embrace the, the altar, what Christ has done for me. I want to commit my life to him. I want to receive his salvation. I want to give my life and my heart to Christ. Is there anybody here that you say, that's, that's me, I'm at the gate. When you pray, would you remember me, Pastor? And in so, so doing, you, you're giving yourself wholeheartedly to God. Okay, does that resonate with anyone? Amen. Let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, for each person who's here, it may be that all of us have come through that gate and we have put our offering, the offering of ourselves on the altar and trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Maybe there are some who are at the gate but haven't yet made that commitment. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that we would discover the life-giving power of God the go and the gospel to save completely. So in Jesus' name, I pray that no one would leave here without experiencing the life you have to offer through the death of Jesus Christ. Pray that you would continue to take us beyond that, beyond the outer court into the place of fellowship with God. So we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.